thank you all for coming tonight. And uh, Dottie is going to welcome us and say a few words. <laughs> well, I'm having a grand time looking at all these, these faces. So welcome, welcome. Uh, it is just so good to see you. And for us to see one another, because I was thinking this morning, just about myself being here, that we don't often have an opportunity at church right now to have this togetherness from both services, but we have this now. And so this is good, this is really good. But I specifically wanted to share with you why we wanted this evening so badly. Um, we want to have dialogue and engage with our bishop, Bishop Patricia Davenport. And we want to share with one another as a faith community, what it's like going through these challenging times and, and how we can help one another. So with this sense of togetherness, we're hoping that at the end, we're gonna walk away believing we will ultimately get through this storm, we will, because we're gonna be led by our faith, which is powerful. And we're going to continue to choose hope. Two powerful things, our faith and hope. So having said this, I turn to our pastor Keith to start the dialogue. <laughs> All right, well, let's see. Thanks everybody, uh, thanks Dottie for arranging this and, and getting this set tonight. Um, it's uh, my honor to introduce uh, Bishop Davenport. So just in case you haven't had a chance to um, read about her, get to know her, uh, encounter her, just want to give you a little bit of um, background uh, by way of introduction and welcoming the bishop. Um, bishop Pat Davenport was elected our bishop of the Southeastern Pennsylvania Synod of the ELCA, um, and she began um, her call August 1st in 2018. She was over, uh, overwhelmingly uh, elected by our Senate Assembly on May 5th of 2018, and she is the first African-American woman to be elected Bishop of the ELCA, and we are very proud. Yes. And she was recently elected Vice Chair of the ELCA Conference of Bishops. There's a lot of churchy words there, and the Bishop is going to break some of that down for us so we know what we're talking about today. Um, uh, Prior to her election as bishop, um, Bishop Davenport served as this at, uh, served our synod as the director for evangelical mission and assistant to the bishop, with responsibilities for new and redeveloping congregations, congregational vitality, and urban ministries. Um, she's a member of Spirit of uh, Spirit and Truth Worship Center, uh, for which she served as its founding pastor and developer. She received her Master of Divinity degree from the former Lutheran Theological Seminary of Philadelphia. Me too. Uh, now you United uh, United Lutheran Seminary, still getting used to that. And she received a certificate in Black uh, Church Concentration from the seminary's Urban Theological Institute. Um, and I will just say uh, less formally that uh, Bishop Davenport is a incredible woman of faith and leader in our church. And you will know that tonight. Um, so Bishop, we are grateful for your presence here with us and for all you do for our church and the churches in our synod and the um, leadership and inspiration you bring to the larger church. And um, with that, I would love, uh, maybe Bishop, if you could just start, um, tell us a little bit about what is a synod? <laughs> what is the ELCA? How do these puzzle pieces fit together? Um, but welcome and thank you for being here. All right, so this is what I'm gonna do. First of all, I'm just so grateful to have this opportunity to be with you. And um, let me just say a word of thank you, um, not only to um, the pastors on the screen, I have to acknowledge Pastor Detweiler and of course, Pastor Anderson, but Sister Dottie for just the gracious invitation to come and have a conversation with you. So I'm, I'm thankful for that. So let me just That's say welcome. it is, it is a joy and a privilege to be with you in sacred cyberspace. Um, <laughs> I am so grateful uh, to be able to have a dialogue with you. And I do mean dialogue. I really believe that um, every time the community gathers, it's a time for information, education, and inspiration that we pray leads to transformation or spiritual maturation. We, we all want to draw closer or be more like Jesus every day. Amen? Amen. Amen. So I'm going to give you 
I'm going to give you just little snippets. And then I'm going to say this to us, and I will put it in the chat before the end of our conversation so you can get the full picture. So uh, I'm going to give you elca.org, and I'm going to give you ministrylink.org. So you will have the bigger picture of what, when I say churchwide, our Evangelical Lutheran Church in America office that's located in Chicago, and our synodical office, which you will find at ministrylink.org, which is located at 7241 Germantown Avenue on the campus of uh, United Lutheran Seminary. And so uh, I think the question was um, also, who is the bishop? What is the bishop? What do they do? So um, we are a part of the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America. And we are 3.2 million strong. And that is broken up into 65 synods. And they are geographically located across the 50 states. And we are one of the 65. And each synod has a bishop over them. And our churchwide office has a presiding bishop that presides over the 65 and over the whole of the ELCA. And so um, what, primarily what is my responsibility? And again, I'm gonna give you those two uh, links so you can just go and get the whole picture. But basically as the Bishop of Southeastern Pennsylvania Senate, I work along with my staff in the office of the Bishop and with the deans and we provide pastoral care and support and resources for our rostered and lay ministers, uh, lay leaders in our 143 congregations and worshiping communities. And so um, as Bishop, according to the constitution, <laughs> there, are, there are three constitutions. So there's one for churchwide, the ELCA constitution, there's one for the Senate, our synodical constitution, and then there's one for Upper Dublin Lutheran Church. So there are three constitutions. We're one body with three expressions, and that's churchwide, synodical, and congregational. And so uh, in this seat, I serve as, according to our constitution, as the Senate's pastor. You know, I, I get to preach and teach and administer the sacraments according with our confessions of faith. And I have the primary uh, responsibility uh, for exercising the church's power to ordain. We were talking about um, prior to you getting on, just being able to um, be at the, or be a part of the ordination for um, one of our candidates. And so uh, that is, Basically, I'm just gonna give you that uh, piece of it. And then um, I guess the larger part of it as a judicatory head is technically I'm the CEO of Southeastern Pennsylvania Senate to make sure that all of our uh, fiduciary responsibilities are carried out. And so I think I'm looking at you to see if that's enough to confuse that's you. Great. Yes, I, that's did tell, I did. I did say to Steve when he said he was in a state of confusion. I did say me too. <laughs> that's that's great, Bishop. And um, I I did put the web addresses in the chat. So okay, great. Thank you so much, them. Pastor. Yeah, yeah. And so I'm just gonna I'm gonna launch in and share some things, and then I want us to be able to have conversation about what I shared. And I'm so grateful that um, you know Dottie talked about faith and hope for me. Hope, I use hope as an acronym, um, helping other people excel. For me, that's, that's what hope is because that's what I've witnessed throughout scripture and throughout uh, history with people who have made a difference, a positive difference on the planet. And so thank you for that. And I think we are all people of faith or else we wouldn't be on the screen. <laughs> so, um, let me, if it's okay with you, Pastor, if I can just start us with um, a word of prayer. Please. Okay. And so actually this is one that I, um, 
I actually got this out of, I don't know whether you all have this or not. I'm, I'm coming to like this. All that's, Creation Sings. That's a new hymnal, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we haven't gotten it yet. We're, we're still exploring it. Okay. Uh, we're looking forward to, to diving in. Wonderful. All right, let me just get to this prayer. Mighty and merciful God, lover of justice and equity, you call us to support the weak, to help those who suffer, and to honor all people. By the power of your Holy Spirit, make us advocates for your justice and instruments of your peace so that all may be reconciled in your beloved community through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. I chose this prayer because it draws our attention to the beloved community. This is our hope and our vision for the world. I, I want us to model this in Southeastern Pennsylvania Senate so powerfully that it causes a ripple effect of grace, love, mercy, and service that causes people who, who drive through or fly over or if they're biking or walking through our Senate to experience the presence and power of God in such a way that it, 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 it makes them to ask the question, did you feel that or, or did you see that? Beloved community where people can be disciples of Christ without question. You can do an act of kindness or generosity in some places and people wanna know why. Like, don't worry, they'll be all right or let them get a job or don't give them any money. They will only buy drugs. Nobody gave me anything. Yet we know we were given something. We know this. We don't just wear it on our t-shirts. We don't just hold it up at football games and basketball games. For God so loved the world that God gave God's only son so that Everyone who believes in God may not perish, but have eternal life. Yes, we stand on scripture as people of faith and people of hope. First John tells us we love because he first loved us. Those who say I love and hate their brothers and sisters are liars. For those who do not love a brother or a sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. The commandment we have from him is this, those who love God must first love their brothers and sisters also. Jesus taught about this when he, whenever he talked about the kingdom of God. It was the prophet's vision of peace where the powerful and the powerless can imagine and enact and, and be in a just world together. Our founder, Martin Luther, you know, I, I love Martin Luther for many reasons, but this is one of the reasons in particular that I love him. Um, Luther argued not only that Christians were saved solely by grace, the grace of God through Christ, and that individuals did not bear the responsibility for their salvation and, and laid out his reform proposals in a series of the, the 95 theses. In doing so, we know that he set the groundwork for what would become the Protestant movement. This is the nugget for me with Brother Martin. When I served on the Lutheran Services in America board, I found this little nugget as we were in a meeting and I'm reading through our, our pamphlet and it said, Luther also created a new approach to charity and service. He argued that because people are saved by grace in gratitude, they are free to serve others. He created the common chess. Funds from the common chess provided assistance to the orphans, children and women, 
It paid for education and vocational training and provided medical services. I'm talking like 500 years ago. The chess also provided low income, low interest loans to artisans and re refinance high interest loans. The idea was that service was not simply about giving charity to the poor, but about helping people avoid poverty in the first place. This is Martin Luther's thinking. The common chess and the philosophy behind it laid the groundwork for what we now know today as Lutheran social ministry. I love it. Luther's call that people care for one another in response to God's grace, it just, it created the framework for modern social service services. And together with the Wittenberg Council, Luther set up what was essentially the first social service agency in Europe. The common chess, the purpose of the chess was simple, to distribute funds to any and all in need. This is Martin Luther's quote that just lays a foundation to this. Martin Luther says, for so to help a man that he does not need to become a beggar is just as much of a good work and virtue as to give alms to a man who has already become a beggar. Luther's call to Christians to care for those in needs was over 500 years ago, but it was not the first. Jesus tells us in scripture, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul and with all your mind and with all your strength. And the second is this, love your neighbor as yourself. There is no greater commandments than these. Isn't that something? I want us to be able to have an opportunity to, to talk about these scriptures, but let me just give you one more. St. James tells us, and I love this, and I'm, I'm purposely not reading out of the um, New Revised Standard. I'm reading this out of the Message Bible. James tells us, Dear friends, do not think you'll get anywhere in this if you learn all of the right words, but never do anything. Does merely talking about faith indicate that a person really has it? For instance, if you come upon an old friend dressed in rags and half starved and say, good morning, friend, be clothed in Christ, be filled with the Holy Spirit and walk off without providing so much as a coat or a cup of soup. Where does that get you? Isn't it obvious that God talk without God acts is outrageous nonsense? I can already hear one of you agreeing by saying, sounds good. You take care of the faith department and I'll handle the works department. Not so fast. You can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. Faith and works, works and faith fit together hand in glove. Why are these scriptures and why is this so important? Over these last two years, we all have experienced disruptions, disruptions with COVID, Delta, Omicron, you name it, um, mass vaccines, virtual worship, unemployment, climate change, yes, tornadoes and storms, civil unrest, and the list goes on. We know what it feels like to navigate uncharted waters uncharted waters of ministry, mission, and service, let alone life. All for purpose, all for purpose. Paul says in Ephesians, 
for it is by grace you have been saved through faith and this not from yourselves, it is a gift of God, not by works so that no one can boast for we are all God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Beloved, we are saved on purpose. Yes, Dottie. We're served on purpose for a purpose. I want us to make a difference every day in the name of Jesus. Make a difference every day in a person, a place, or a thing. Always leave it better than we found it as a result of our discipleship. That, that's what my hope is. That's what my prayer is. Um, that's what I, I try to model as not just Bishop, um, as a person, as I said to Dottie, when I'm in these conversation, I believe in the priesthood of all believers. I believe we all bring something to the conversation with, with our faith journey, whether we're taking the first steps of faith or whether we've been on this journey for a long time we all bring something to this because of God's spirit within us. And so I would like to hear from you, what is, what is the hope and vision and mission for not just Upper Dublin Lutheran Church, but for you, as a believer of Christ. All right, George, I see you shaking your head. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you you ask you ask a good question. Like, I, you know, so without any time to react, like my my hope really is is to just be a faithful servant, and and, and uh, which is pretty pretty ambiguous i realize that but but it's it's really how how do you how do you how do i you, you you framed it in the right way which is to not broad brush it but what what does it mean to us as an individual so for me as an individual i would i would love to be able to remain a positive a positive factor in god's kingdom you know that's that's in the church that's in in our home that's as a husband that's a, as a father that's as a uh, a child of Christ, you know. That's as a fellow brother and sister. That's figuring out um, how to love your neighbor, like you said. You know, we're 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 not all seeing things eye to eye, and and and, and uh, judge not, lest ye be judged, and 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 you know, God can sort through that. So how how do how do we how do we keep on keeping on? You know, I'm when I say we, I mean me. How do how, uh, to be more specific keeping on a high energy level high hope i like how you had the acronym for hope and it's really it's really just balanced to me like 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 you lay out a lot of good things early on and in my mind i'm thinking yeah that's that's all that's all right you know i need to be <laughs> doing it you know how can i how can i help more people out and how can i also um find time to eat and do my job and 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 and, and uh and spend time with my wife. So, so balanced. So, not a very, not a very uh, concise answer for you, Bishop. Other than, other than just looking to, looking really to, to keep up the good fight. And, and part of what I was hoping to learn tonight is just, is, is, is exactly what you're doing. A little bit of um, encouragement, enthusiasm, a little bit of like vision setting, and just a little bit of um, connecting the dots and, and uh, shot in your arm and keep, keep on keeping on. Amen, George. You're absolutely right. And yeah, thank you. Is that an eight out of ten or a seven out of ten? What do you think? That was a ten out of ten. Oh, there you go. Right. You're on point. You're on point. All right, all right. So it's good. Olivia. Okay. Yeah. Oh, thanks, Bishop. It's <laughs> nice to meet you. You too, George. Olivia. Well, li listening to you. Uh, so, as the person who works with children. Uh, uh, my prayer is, and my hope is that we all see ourselves as God's beloved children and that we can see the beauty 
in the uniqueness of each individual uh, and, and to treat each other with love and respect and acknowledge that beauty and look at these wonderful gifts that we're all just this beautiful, beautifully wrapped gift package and inside of us are these wonderful gifts to share. But in a recent conversation with someone I love very much who is uh, getting ready to uh, go out into the real world out of college, uh, has had a very successful career in college and has heard from many people, oh, you're gonna have such a great career, blah, 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 has put out all these feelers for jobs and hasn't gotten a call back. And so her comment to me was, Grams, I don't feel worthy of their praise. And so that is a new thing, a new hope and wish that I have. I hope and pray that all people feel worthy. I did my Sunday school teacher thing, you know, and said, you know, a long time ago on a big hill called Calvary, God came right on down and he made you worthy and don't ever let anybody tell you. And, and then when he rose again, he showed you that love is the greatest force that there is and, and nothing that happens can ever be as powerful as love. But I think that listening to her, I, I, it's, just an, it's just a more of an awareness for me that I pray that all people feel worthy. Mm. And, and that is part of that line between accompaniment and encouragement and not acting as if we're doing something good for someone else but we're all made worthy by jesus we all Amen. deserve everything we need so being worthy is another a feeling worthy for everyone to feel worthy of the love that god has given to them is is a really a, a prayer of mine amen thank you olivia so i'm going to tell you this real quick so one of the things when i was a developer and so for me, my, my task is to be out and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ wherever I am. And so um, I went to a, hair, a unisex hair salon. And so I knew that the woman had come to church. I went to follow up and take her some um, in Christ's life to, for her to give out at the, at the shop. And so I went one day and I told her, I said, you missed church. I said, um, I have my communion kit. And um, I, let me just give you a capsule of what the, the service was. And so I, I did that. And I said, um, would you like communion? And so, you know, if you're going to open up the table, you open up the table to everyone in the space. And there was a woman there who said to me, I'm not worthy to receive communion. And I said to her, sweetheart, none of us are worthy. That's why Christ came you know, and, and to, to help her to understand we're all sinners saved by grace, God's grace. It's about what God did. So thank you so much for sharing that with that person. You know, it's, it's about what Christ did for us. We're not worthy, but God loved us so much, you know, and God wanted to be yes. reconciled to us so much mm -hmm. that God sent God's son. So, you know, I, I love that. And one of the scriptures that I, I use all the time with, um, with all of God's children is, you are fearfully and wonderfully made. <laughs> you know, I love that scripture. Because I do too. No matter I where I am, that. whether I'm talking to someone who's experiencing homelessness or mm -hmm. on the street, or whether I'm talking to someone in one of our nursing homes who's who's um, fragile and and you know they're there and they're like, oh, you know, here I am, and I'm like, no, 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 no. God has been with you on this journey. And, and yes, you're 89 and you're 89 fearfully and wonderfully made in the image of God. And for us to understand that I think is, is so important. So thank you for your words of encouragement. And, and the other thing is um, I've learned this in the pandemic, even though it's a little bit challenging, but to be able to, um, to pin a note to someone is, is just invaluable, you know, and um, being able to, uh, to, to, to show our, our love in different ways. And so I'm like thinking, all right, Lord, how much does a stamp cost? And um, some time for me to just sit down and, and write a scripture out. My, my favorite one is Proverbs 3, 5, and 6. Um, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge God and God will direct your path. And um, let me just say that, Steve, that's the one I use because I'm so confused and um, I can just look to God and God will direct my path. So thank you, Olivia. 
I'm going to, um, Pastor, if it's okay, I'm going to go to, yes, Kingdom. Yes, Olivia, you're so right. Um, Our field ed student, Kathleen, preached a good sermon uh, on that, on the Kingdom. Yeah, Kingdom. Uh, kingdom. I give Kathleen all the credit for that. <laughs> No, that's what we're about. This is that's what right. we're experiencing now on the screen is the kingdom of God. Um, someone at George asked about tithing to extend one's time as well as one's funds. Um, tithing for me is a part of our stewardship and stewardship is managing, you know, merely managing what God gives to us. And um, so I think... Um, for me, it, it's also a, an act of faith. It's a part of who I am. I, I am a tither, uh, even though I don't give a tithe um, because I think tithe is just a starting point. I'm very blessed, I'm very privileged. So I start there, uh, I'm working my way. Um, I want you to know my financial advisor tells me, she says, you can't keep giving like this. And I'm like, I can't not keep giving like this. Um, because I am so fortunate and able to do it. So uh, I pushed my way past 15%. I'm at 18%. My hope is to get to 20% uh, in, in, the, in the near future. But again, it's about balance, George. It's about balance. Bishop Davenport? Yes. I was wondering if I could ask a question. Um, of and thank you. Can ask a question. <laughs> thank you for being here. You had uh, very well um, delineated the hierarchy of the uh, uh, Lutheran, the Evangelical Lutheran Church. Can you tell me a little bit more about what the autonomy of the parish has in relationship to what your responsibilities of making the rules and regulations about? Okay, Un unfortunately, so because of how my screen is set up, I can't see who was saying that. Oh, um, I apologize. My name is Ginny, and I have been a member of UDLC for seven years. Okay, no, Ginny, I just wanted to be able to address you by name. So again, there are three, so three constitutions. So uh, if that's another thing, Ask pastor for a copy of your constitution so you can see. I'm going to say this, and if anybody lets it out on the screen, I know that you told it. So people think that the bishop has power and authority over our congregations. Guess what? I have none. Because of the way that we are, our hierarchy is set up, uh, there are only um, a couple of ways that I can come into your congregation. And, and that would be something that we know would never happen. That would be if your pastor behaved badly. And we know that would never happen, right, Pastor Anderson? And um, if you were um, diminished in, in your capacity to care for yourself, then constitutionally, I have to um, make sure that you're cared for. And I think that's it. Is that it, Pastor Anderson or, or, or Pastor Detweiler? Are, aren't those the only way that I'm, I'm able to come into the congregation? If the council invited you. Yes. The, count, the council could invite you. Yes. For some reason. Yes. If you're going to invite me for anything, That's invite it. me for worship, invite me for coffee hour, invite me for dinner, invite me for lunch, invite me for something like that. So thank you, Bishop Davenport. I, I guess the reason for my question was, um, I, I see in the area, there are a lot of differences in um, evangelical Lutheran churches in relationship to what is going on during COVID. Who's, uh, um, who is giving processional communion out as opposed to individual communion? Uh, um, who, how many like uh, 
oh, um, not congregants, oh, how many people are on the altar, uh, right. whether they're masked or not masked, that kind of thing. And I was wondering where those decisions came from. So I, I am able to, and that's a part of what my task is, oversight of our congregations. So it is me doing my due diligence to provide guidelines for you. And so um, our, if you go on ministry link, you will see their CDC guidelines for the pandemic. And so we use those guidelines to hold them up as a measure. One of the things that I know and I take to heart is that I am to protect the church. And when I say the church, I mean the lay people who sit on the pews, the rostered ministers who lead and guide us in the communities where we are housed at. And so in order to do that, we provide guidelines for you. Now, adhering to those guidelines is up to the congregation. Again, so I, I, that's why I, I delineated between the three expressions and the three constitutions. Thank you very, very much. No, thank you for your question. That was a, a good question. And, and the reason, that's why I prefaced it with, the, the bishop really has, don't tell anybody, <laughs> no power to, to enforce any of that. Um, however, it is uh, really a part of my responsibility to make sure that you are aware of the dangers that are out there and to be sure to keep you safe and to keep your brothers and sisters safe who sit on the pews with you. Um, and, and other than that, you know, I'm, I'm like following everything else, you know, please wear your mask, please, you know, get vaccinated. And again, these are all things that I'm following from, we live in two kingdoms. And so, you know, I'm following the guidelines from CDC, but I'm also asking us to follow scripture, love your neighbor as yourself, do no harm. Other questions? I, I put the, the bishop's latest um, guidance on, on uh, COVID in the chat So from, uh, from this month. So I put that in, Bishop, so people could see that. But um, other questions, comments, um, things that are giving you hope and life and um, any, any reactions to what the bishop has shared with us? I have. Yes, Sister Dottie. Yes. <laughs> Okay, uh, just for the record, I've been quiet quite a while here. <laughs> no, um, you heard me uh, speak of hope, which is integral to many people, myself very strongly. Um, so I, I refuse to give up on the church and where we will be uh, when we come to terms either with COVID or learn how to live with it, whatever, I believe the church will be here. When asked by some members of my congregation, what does that look like to you? The only concrete answer that I can respond is we will be here together. Amen. Whether that still means uh, for some people watching on uh, Facebook or YouTube rather, or sitting in the pew, whether that means we will be separated by space, we will be here. So I have trouble coming up with something more specific than that as a response. Is there something else that you could tell me to say? Sister Dottie, what's wrong with your response? It's a truthful response. Well, yeah. That it, it's a truthful response because we, we now are living into this new abnormal. And it's a new abnormal. It, it, there's nothing normal about how we're doing this, right? And so you think about this. I've, I'm saying this to our rostered ministers. You from now on will always have to have something on a digital platform. Why? Because now there is a community of people out there who, who, who come in to worship and who have been brought they have been brought into community on a digital platform. And so we can't just say, oh, 
Now we are open back up and we can have, you know, a hundred people in worship. So we're no longer going to live stream or YouTube or record. So then what does that do with the community that has been formed that I like to think God has given us an opportunity to reach people that we never would have been able to reach exactly. on this digital platform. Yeah. And so we can't just let that go away. So now we will be able to, to have this digital platform. We'll be able to have people in worship. And so it's going to be different. It's going to be different layers. But like you said, when you first got on, I am so grateful that we're able to have people from both services on the screen. You know, you're in this service, I'm in this service, but here in this place, I like to call it sacred cyberspace because I believe the Holy Spirit works on, on this platform, just like the Holy Spirit works when we are present together in person. And so I, I think we're gonna we're gonna see us worshiping in different ways. Um, one of the um to to know is that the Holy Spirit does work, and and I can say this. This is why I I just believe the Holy Spirit is always at work. So I was there at I was there at worship in Upper Dublin, and and Pastor Anderson was preaching. He was proclaiming the word. And he was saying about, um, oh, what was the scripture reference? I can't, I can't remember it. But I, I had to call him after service and say to him how eloquently he had woven into the gospel message about the death of the members of the congregation. Because you had three that week. I think you had three that week. Mm -hmm. And how you had woven them into the gospel message. So there was life and there was death and there was resurrection. And it had, I felt that. I felt that. And I wasn't in the spot on the pew, but I was on a digital platform where it impacted me so that I called the pastor to say thank you. So I, I, I know that the Holy Spirit works uh, in, in this space that God has created, you know, what does scripture tell us? All things, all things are, are for good. All things work together for good for those of us who love God and are called according to God's purpose. All things. We see the pandemic as this horrible thing and, and, and there is death and, and all of that is happening. In the midst of it, God has been showing us things. There is never a lose, lose. There is always it may be lost, but we learn. And so we have learned so many things. And um, I, I am just grateful in the midst of this, we have seen death and we have seen resurrection and we have been able to see God work in, in mystical and ways that we would never would begin to imagine. People are saying to me that membership has increased their giving has increased. Their giving has increased because people are on a digital platform. Now it, it comes right out. They can point and click and they can give their offerings. So who would have thought in a pandemic that financial giving would increase? Thank you. Thank you for the question, Dottie. And again, I, I, I really, I don't, I don't have any of the answers. I can only share with you what's here. And other things you can find on ministry link or elca.org, the concretes. I'm telling you how I experience God in the midst of, of our communities of faith. If, if I could just add on to what you're saying, I and we here at Upper Dublin, I, I know I'm speaking God's truth here, that we have seen gifts, and I'm not talking monetary gifts, but we have seen gifts come out of the wretched times of the pandemic, a gift of creativity, a gift of deeper faith a gift of believing in tomorrow, even when we are struggling today. 
those gifts are there and they are, as you said, from the Holy Spirit. And I would offer up to anybody who wants to listen that right now and for always, these are wonderful things and they define us. And I love when we sing about being the church. I love that because it is a we. Yes. And I, uh, I just want to underscore when you speak of the Holy Spirit. We're pretty big believers here at Upper Dublin in the Holy Spirit. Hey, I, I have seen the Spirit work there in ways that are just, you know, I, I look at the, the food pantry. I look at the, the, the gifts, you know, people just bringing not just their hands, but their hearts to that ministry. I, I look at when the storm came and, and the people who were pulling trees and, and, and leaves and, and, and cleaning up, you know, that they, they, put, they put their bodies into action, you know, faith into action. And, and they went and they helped. And so again, I, I, I just so appreciate that because it just connected for me, Martin Luther and his um, common chest and how we, we go out and we do these things for the sake of the other, you know, and um, just Upper Dublin has, let me just give you um, the, the really the accolades that you deserve for, for really just being the church in the community in a time of need. You know, you, you didn't say let, you know, let Bethlehem do it. You said, no, here we are. This is our community and people showed up. And so, you know, I applaud that. I, I get to watch from the balcony. That's why I'm so grateful for this digital platform. I get to see what people are doing. You know, I get to see the body of Christ at work. And for us in the Evangelical Lutheran Church in America, God's work, our hands, is not just our motto. It's not just a mantra. It's, it's not just a tagline. It's what we do. It's who we are. And so I, I am, I, I, I applaud you. Thank you again. Other uh, questions, comments, um, things giving you hope in life? Kathleen is very, Kathleen is very hopeful. I see it all over her persona. It's there. I want you to know, Kathleen, I was paying attention. I was paying attention when you were nodding. I was right there with you. Bishop, how, how about for yourself? Like, I, I know you touched base on this already with maybe your general, a lot, a lot of, your, a lot of uh, what you've spoken about already, but what, what, are, you, what are you hoping for for, for next year or what, or thereafter, what are you hoping to see at your church, the churches in the, in the uh, Synod? What are you hoping for them and so forth? I, I am hoping for us not to be distracted. Yes. I, I have seen, I have seen distractors, you know, um, disruptions and distractions. Um, I think one of the things, and um, Dottie, I think you put this in, in your little, piece to me about um, navigating, un navigating uncharted waters. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, and, and really with that, George, these are uncharted waters for many of us. We just have to stay the course, stay the course and not, and not be distracted by all of these things that are going on that take us off course of our path. What are we called to do? We are called to show up. We're called to be God's hands. You know, we're, we're called to to feed and care for those who are hungry, to provide them. We're called to, to walk with those who are experiencing homelessness to be sure that they get housed. We, we, are, we, are, we are commissioned to go and proclaim the good news of the gospel. We are, we are to teach. Thank you, Olivia. We are to teach and um, pastor. We are to baptize. We are to confirm. Those are the things that we're supposed to do. We lift up the cross of Christ in the midst of it, throughout scripture, it says, you are light. We are light to those who are in dark places. We give hope to those who are in despair. And that's why I say, this is about ministry and daily life. Our faith is inter inextricably interwoven into our daily life. It's about who you show up to be, George, as a husband. 
It's about who you show up to be, George, as a father. That, that, that's for me, for us not to get distracted by this and to lose who we are, who we came through the waters of baptism and, and, and you know, the candle. And so, so we are to be light, we are to be salt. You know, salt doesn't do anybody any good if it's in the shaker. Right. You know, and the shaker is Sunday, we, we come to church and we fill up our, our salt shaker and then we take it and we put it on the table. No, when, when we get our, when, when Pastor, um, Pastor Anderson and, and Pastor Detweiler and uh, Kathleen, uh, you know, fill us up with, with that word on Sunday and, and we get it in there and you know what we do? We go out the door like this. You know, you leave some in the parking lot leave some in the hallway, you know, shaking it. And when you get home, your wife says to you, George, <laughs> you're like, salt, baby, salt. That's very good. It's very good. You know, but yeah. again, you know, we, we're supposed, that's what God calls us to be. We're salt in tasteless situations. You know, we're, we're salt. Um, salt is a preservative. You know, we preserve things that are, that are good so that they'll last longer. That, that's what we're called to be. And so, for me, things knock us off our path. And I'm like, as disciples of Christ, nobody said that this was going to be easy being a disciple of Christ. That's nowhere in scripture. Pastor Detweiler, is in scripture that it's going to be easy being a disciple? <laughs> but we just have to stay the course. This is my more than you ask for, George. No, it's good. It's good. In the morning, I signed myself with the seal of, seal of the cross. I said, I am sealed with the cross of Christ, filled with the Holy Spirit, sent, gathered, and claimed for the sake of the world. That's my get up and go. You know, and it's not that things aren't going to come at me. Um, in scripture, it says, to whom much is given, much is required. To be in this office as bishop, to be in this office as an African-American woman, um, everybody is not happy about it. I just want you to know that. Everybody is not happy that the Black woman is at the top giving orders, you know? We're, 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 very, we're very happy about it. We're very happy about it. I, 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 I'm just saying, you know, that, that's the only no, I thing I have. You. I can I only tell you the truth. No, you know, I, I, I everybody's know that. Everybody's not point. happy about it. And so you know what I say? You know what, God, you called me to this position. You equipped me for this position. And that's why I always invite the Holy Spirit to speak to me and then speak through me. So that, you know, it's not about me. It's not about this, but it's about how God uses this instrument to accomplish what God needs to accomplish. You know, and I can't get distracted by uh, racist comments or sexist comments. I can't get distracted by them because this is this is this is the way that I have to go. And so if if I'm going to get knocked off keel when everybody says something disparaging to me, I can't accomplish the work that God has given me to do. And so yeah. that's why you know I stay prayed up. You laid it out really well. Like I see your hands. You, you know it's a rudder. You know you're not going to get blown off course. You know. Yeah, that's. Yeah, that's that's really that's fantastic. I I keep this close to me so I can remind myself of that whenever things are going off course. I'm like, Lord, we need to have a conversation. Donna posted a question in the chat. Donna, that's a great question. How, 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 well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to ask that everybody just take a minute to look at the chat and, and, and we can all have an opportunity to answer this. So um, I, I am very grateful to have seven grandchildren. So I have seven grandchildren. The youngest one is five. The oldest one is 20. Help me, Lord. But I have an opportunity to 
to go to the movies and, and, and have dinner afterwards or to get on the floor and play with puzzles, you know? And it's really just being present with them and walking with them and encouraging them on the journey. You know, I, I am one for sending texts to my grand, everybody has a phone, I'm just saying. So I send them texts, I send them scripture references, I send them funny memes with the scripture reference on it. Um, you know, I, I think just walking with them, one of the things, Skyle Ray is our new uh, assistant to the Bishop for Youth and Young Adults. And so one of the conversations that we had, I really believe this, I really believe that, I call them fidgets, the little people. If we are having conversations with our little people, helping them to love themselves, to know that they are fearfully and wonderfully made and that God loves them and we love them. If we're able to do that with them, then we don't have to wait until they get the confirmation. They already know it. They know that they are loved. They know the Lord's prayer. They, 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 they have all of that uh, in them. It's on the journey. So we can, we can walk with them from the cradle to the grave. You know, it, it's about spiritual maturation. It's about how we grow. Um, and again, the positive vibes draw positive vibes. So if you're not beating up on them and forcing them to do things, um, I think I think we'll be good. Wait a minute, I said that. Where is Carol at? She left because Carol was sitting next to her mom and she was reading her book. Oh, Claire was there with Aaron. Yeah, Claire. Now Dash, Claire. Now Dash yeah. is there. Dash is yeah. there. Dash. Oh, that Aaron's that. What, Aaron, who is that? I, I'm sorry, I'm new. I don't know him. Uh, this is Dash. He's got a very runny nose. He's hanging out. And Claire is taking the puppy company down there. She'll be here you speak for a little bit. Yeah, but I, I love that. So it's just like um, when I'm on Zoom calls and, and the, the fidgets are in the back, I'm like, bring them up, let them get on the camera. And, and so they get up and, and we have conversation, but they are part of this. Um, you know, Bishop, uh, with that, that question of younger generations reminded me, I saw something posted uh, recently uh, and it was like in some ministry Facebook group or whatever. And it said, uh, everybody should have a mentor under, an under 30 mentor. And, uh, the kind of idea was like, you know, so that you can be aware of what's going on. And I'm grateful to have Kathleen and then Lindsay before her and, um, uh, and our field ed students who have, you know, helped us to open our eyes to different things and hear new stories and, um, hear about new experiences. But, um, you know, I think that, um, it's sort of when we think about young people, we want to think about what we we think about our experience and what we want to impart, and that's part of the equation. And the other part is learning from them. You know, like you know, I I find like the spiritual lives of young adults are like so different um, from mine, and so different from what I grew up with. Um, but they're so fascinating because they're so different. They've been exposed to so many different things. They grew up with the internet. You know, so it's sort of like like I like, this is I I don't quite you know I don't quite get this but man this is really interesting I'm very curious I want to learn, um, and I think sometimes asking, just asking that question about kind of on this more spiritual level like how do you make meaning about this how do you understand this how do these pieces fit for you, it winds up opening like a really interesting conversation that then we can share, how those dots connect for our, for us as well, so. Oh, you got to be careful with those questions because then they ask you questions back. And oh, so, yeah. so, I, so I want you to know, this is the question. So my mom, can you proclaim that in a two minute TikTok? <laughs> yep. First of all, it's like, who's going to teach me how to do a TikTok? Keith, catechetics class. We got we to do some TikToks. <laughs> How about it? You know, I wrote the books on, on digital ministry, but I'm not doing TikTok. <laughs> no, I love it. You, you're leaving it up to 77-year-old Livy to do it? I will do it. I will do it. <laughs> no, you're so you're so right, Pastor Anderson. They they are a joy, you know. I and I do I do very good of, of being boundary with with um using sermon illustrations 
And so, you know, you got to get permission. But, but some of the things that they share with me are like gems, you know, like real gems like that. Like, really, you think about it. So we, we, um, we are faith storytellers. So, so what you, like, if I say to you, what's your two minute elevator speech, you'll know what that, what that is. But for him to say to me, can you do a TikTok? Like, can you tell that in, in two minutes in a TikTok to tell the story of Jesus Christ, life, death, resurrection? I'm like, what? <laughs> but it's like, it, he was saying to me, like, if you want to capture the, because I asked him the question, it's like, how do I, how do I communicate this? Or you like, where are you at with this? And then it's like, first of all, Facebook is for old people, you know, Instagram, tweet me, you know, if you want me to follow you, things like that, but I can only have those conversations with them. And so again, I'm grateful that I have that range, you know, from 20 to five that I can kind of hang out with. And the other thing is, thank you, Jesus, all of our staff, all of the Senate staff, <clears throat> you'll be happy to know. All of them are younger than I am. And you'll even be happier to know that four of them are under 40. I see you, Kathleen, laughing. Four of them are under 40. You know, um, I'm coming from being a, a teacher of teenagers in the classroom. And I found my greatest strength with them was by my action and my words to indicate that I knew they were there, mm. that I validated who they were by my attention, by my listening. And maybe I was not understanding always what they wanted of me, but they knew that I was invested in them. And so they would be kind to me <laughs> and then share with me what, what it was. And I think back to the original question that, you know, with young people in psychology, we're taught that modeling is, is a great tool of what we want from a child to be kind, to be present, mm -hmm. to be honest. So, so that's a big part. But all the other things that you're mentioning, I think have great value. But again, starting from the point of, I, I, I know you're here. And I want to, I want to learn from that, or I want to be with you. And I have found out that in my own experience, children and teens have been very forgiving uh, and accepting of, of my age and where I come from versus where, where they're coming from, you know? So I think sometimes just practicing good human kind skills, you know, with, with how we would want to be. Uh, accept it also. Yeah, Amen. Thanks, I um, gotta say this. I gotta say. This. I want to say something to Linda, but I want to say something to Ruth first. <clears throat> so, so Ruth, my mom's name is Ruth, and I'm, I'm gonna tell you, just like you just lifted your head up. Most of the time, when I'm on the screen with my mom, Ruth, I'm saying to her, "Mom, mom, lift the screen up so I can see your whole face." Lift the screen up so I can see your whole face. There you are, Ruth. I can see your whole face. <laughs> and and Linda, Linda, you look like you, you Linda, you look like you have a question. Am I the only Linda? Yes. I, the Linda you're talking about? <laughs> no, I, I'm just sorry because it's almost past my bedtime too. Oh gee. We we don't want to keep we don't want to keep Linda up. Wait a minute, let me see what time it is. No, not quite mine. I, I go at least until nine. Yeah, yeah. Praying that I don't have a meeting that goes until nine. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I've been awake since four this morning. I couldn't sleep. Oh my goodness, God bless you. So now I'm sorry, I don't have a question. I'm I'm listening. Oh. <laughs> it was when when you did, I was like, it's like she's pondering, should I ask this or should I not ask it? <laughs> So everyone else is good. Um, I have a Dottie, Diane is agreeing with you. Lauren has a yeah, question. I have a question. Um, 
I guess when Donna asked that question earlier, I guess I had a similar question, but I was thinking from my perspective um, as like a younger generation. So I am in the 30 to 40 category, category and this pandemic has really thrown my faith for a loop. Um, and I am at a point in my life where I am raising children and I am working full time. And, um, you know, we were living through a pandemic. And so that idea of hope, it, it's when you ask, like, where is your hope? I don't know where mine is. And so that question that Donna asked was, I guess I was hoping sh that answer was going to come for the people in their 30s and 40s and not for like the little people where everyone geared their questions because as the person raising the little people if I don't if I can't find it how am I supposed to give it um and so you know I feel very lost and I don't know if I'm speaking for myself or other people in their 30s and 40s but work is frustrating. I'm a teacher and um, trying to give to other people's kids all day long, trying to give to my kids at nighttime and then trying to, you know, um, you know, be a wife at the same time. It that's very overwhelming during a pandemic. And so that's why I kind of came tonight looking for where, where does that hope come from when I can't find it for myself right now? So, so Lauren, that, that is an excellent, excellent question. And I'm glad that you bring this up. So I've been talking with our rostered ministers. And so you know um, what we're experiencing now is what they're calling the great resignation. Um, you know, people just really just walking off of their jobs saying enough already, I just can't do this. And, and so, so, so what is the word of encouragement to them? You know, what is the word of encouragement? So I'm gonna, I can only give you, I can only give you what I got. And, um, and that's what I'm sharing to them. And um, George kind of nailed it. You know, we have to keep a healthy balance. And, and this is one of the things where really you can't take care of anybody else if you're not taking care of yourself. This really is a case of putting on your own oxygen mask first. And so, so whatever feeds your soul, whatever brings you joy, whatever helps you to come back to that place where, where, where really you feel is if, as if you are reclaiming yourself, then, then that's where you have to go in order to get it. Um, for me, and I can only speak for me. So for me, that is in um, listening to uh, either positive messages um, or practicing um, mindfulness and, and meditation just to be still and um, the things that really rejuvenate me, and I don't know whether you do yoga or anything like that, but to be able to do the things that help you to claim yourself back so that you can be wife and mom and teacher and all of those things. Um, and again, I can only give you the things that work for me and, and other people.